Evangelism or Four Fields Missions, something like that. And you'll find a, a number of different groups um, that do that. Um, but the first one is what I want to introduce today. Now, that said, I, I just want to warn you, in Ephesians 4, 11 through 12, the Bible says, I'm just going to paraphrase it, but the Bible says that different gifts are given to the church, namely one of those being preaching, prophecy, and so on, that those gifts are given to the church for the building up of the body and the equipping of the saints. So I know being in the Deep South and a traditional Baptist church, we're used to a specific style of preaching. And I typically preach through a passage, although this series, the Great Commission is big paintbrush picture of what God is doing in the Bible. So this series has been less about a specific passage. But I just want to forewarn you that the next three to four sermons are going to be very much about equipping so we're going to have a number of different passages that we're looking at, that we're referencing, but we're not following one specific passage for the next couple of weeks because I want to talk through with you each of those four fields. We established last, or not last week, I think it was two weeks ago, you know, we established that that is a biblical framework to use. So now that we understand that, I want to kind of define each one of those fields. So today we're talking about entering a field. If you want to enter a new field, and you can turn if you want to Luke chapter 12, we'll also be in Luke 10 and Acts 17 at various points. Um, but I'll go ahead and turn to Luke 12 and have that ready in just a moment. But if you're going to enter a new field... You have to find the field first, right? If you want to plant crops, the first thing you have to do is find the field, right? I would assume that would at least be a beginning step. This on, right? Okay, I got one person awake this morning, right? You have to know where you're going to plant first. And then can you just plant anywhere that you want to? No, there's a number of different factors involved. What do you think is the biggest factor involved in whether or not to plant a field? Flooding. What's that? Flooding. Flooding. The low country around here. Especially in the low country. We learned about flooding this morning. What grows here, what grows here versus what doesn't. Yeah, it's important. Is the soil going to support anything? Even more basic than that, you guys knew I had a catch in there somewhere. Even more basic than that, do you have a right to plant the field that you chose? If you don't own the property and you don't have permission, probably not a good idea to plant there, correct? So you have to find a place that you're able to plant first, that you're allowed to, and then you can worry about all the details of farming that I don't understand, of whether the soil is good and all the other good stuff that you guys mentioned. But you have to know where you're going first, and then you have to have the ability, the permission to plant. And then you can work on planting the seed and growing and then ultimately, hopefully, reaping a good harvest for your labor. So there are two primary ways or two primary fields that we deal with on a daily basis. The first one, your sphere of influence, right? If you own property and you want to plant food on your own property or a crop, then Unless you have an HOA, which proves you don't really own it, that's a whole other discussion for a whole other day, you have a right to plant on your own property. So your sphere of influence is your property. So here's the question. Where do you spend the majority of your time? And with whom do you spend the majority of your time? We're going to come back to that because I want to go ahead and give you the second one. The second one is new fields, new areas that you don't own yet or you haven't been there yet. 
Maybe there's a piece of property that you want to buy so that you can plant your seed, so that you can grow and harvest. Maybe it's a totally new area. Maybe you want to invest in somewhere far off that has better yield and you're just going to hire somebody to go there. You're a professional businessman at that point or woman. But you have two different areas. You have the areas that you're already in and you have the areas that you're not already in. And yes, I'm making this painfully simple, but I'm making it painfully simple because I think we tend to overcomplicate life and the gospel. It's not that there aren't depths to it. It's not that there aren't intricacies that we can debate all day, every day. But at its root, the gospel is very simple. At its root, sharing Jesus with other people is painfully simple. You have somewhere that you regularly are, and you have other places that you are not regularly. So let's go back to the first one, your sphere of influence, the question that I asked you. Where do you spend the majority of your time? It's going to be different for every person, and it's going to be different in every season of life. When you're a child, you spend most of your life, not counting the pandemic era, Where do you spend the majority of your time as a child? At school and playing with other kids, whether that be at school or the neighborhood or whatever, right? That's what you do as a kid and, of course, your family. But then you get to be a teenager. Well, I guess that doesn't really change in most of the modern era. Um, But let's fast forward to when the kid finally moves out at 30 or 40. Where does that young adult spend the majority of their time? At work, and if they're not married yet, hanging out with friends outside of work. That's their sphere of influence. And then once they get married, there tends to be this trade-off and adjustment. It's a different season of life. And then once you have kids, where do you spend the majority of your time? Work and family, and that's about all you got time for sometimes, right? And then you become an empty nester. That's when you start trying to figure out where to spend your time. Probably still work. And then you hit retirement age. Where do you spend most of your time? Depends on what you want to do and what you're able to do in that season of life. But you get the idea, right? My question to you is where do you spend time? You personally. You don't have to answer me on this one. But where do you personally spend time? Congratulations, everything you just answered is your field. Did you know you have more than one field? You do now. Everywhere that you spend any sort of real time is a field that you already own spiritually because God has given you that sphere of influence. So your job is to figure out within this sphere of influence that God has given me, and make no mistake about it, God has given you that sphere of influence for a reason. It's not an accident that you're in that sphere of influence. Within that sphere of influence, how do you faithfully present the gospel? That's the question. Now, I'm going to answer the question more next week. This week is a lot about asking the right questions. Next week is hopefully answering some of those questions. But I want to look at a few passages to give you an idea of how Jesus and the apostles influenced within their sphere of influence. Because if we want to know how to be great at doing something spiritually, who should we look to first? The examples in Scripture. Jesus himself, if it applies, Jesus didn't run a church. He talked about it, but he didn't actually run a church. So we can't look to Jesus as the example there. We have to look at what he taught us and then what his apostles did with his teaching. 
So we look to Jesus, we look to the apostles, and then we look for positive and negative examples in Scripture. You can learn from anything and anyone if you're wise, which is the irony of wisdom. Because as you do that, you become more wise. We talked about that recently as well. So Luke chapter 12, verses 41 to 52. Chapter 12, verses 41 to 52. And I apparently wrote down the wrong reference, so I apologize for that. So that is not the correct reference. I thought that I was writing down the reference. Um, Somebody can call it out if you can find it. Um, The passage where Jesus is with his parents as a child, and they go to the temple, and they're worshiping at the temple, and then they leave, and they go, I think it was a day's journey or two days' journey, And all of a sudden, they look around, where's Jesus? Where'd he go? Because he's a child, right? Now, many of you probably have an oops, I left my child somewhere story. It's sadly easy to do sometimes. In fact, it's really sad that a lot of modern cars now have to flash something up on the display to tell people to do that or to not do that. But Jesus' parents left without him. Now, it would be easier than you think in their day because they traveled in groups. And it would be very easy to think that he was with someone else, which is usually how it happens even in the modern day. But regardless, what is it? Luke 2, 41? Okay, so I added a 1 then. So let's go to Luke chapter 2. Thank you. Yeah, that looks better. All right, Luke chapter 2, verse 41. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he became 12, they went up there according to the custom of the feast. And as they were returning after spending the full number of days, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. Notice, did it say he got lost? No. Did the first thing say his parents left him? No, what did it say? Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. It was intentional on Jesus' part. Now, as a parent, you want to take corrective action on that, of course, because that's not acceptable. But then again, I can't imagine trying to parent God in flesh. Jesus chose to stay behind, but his parents were unaware of it. But supposed him to be in the caravan and went a day's journey, and they began looking for him among their relatives and acquaintances. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. Now, some of you know this story, and you already know why Jesus stayed behind. But if you don't know this story offhand, in your brain, why do you think Jesus chose to stay behind? I mean, was this just God in flesh being rebellious? Well, clearly that wouldn't be consistent because he wouldn't be sinless if he was being rebellious. So that can't be it. But why would Jesus choose to stay behind? And let's see, where were they? They went to Jerusalem at the feast, and they would have taken part in the services. To to put it in modern terms, it was the yearly thing at the church. And it's not that they only went to church once a year in the way we'd think about it. There was a specific festival that they were obligated to go to yearly. So essentially, Jesus stayed behind at church on purpose is a way to paraphrase that. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. Then after three days, they found him. Three days, can you imagine? I mean, Jesus didn't just choose to stay behind Jesus got lost, not literally, but like it took them three days to find him. I can't imagine being that parent, and I hope that I never have to go through that. Then after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. 
And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and what? His answers. See, when people tried to trap Jesus later in life, what was his number one tool for avoiding being trapped by a verbal trap? What's his number one tool? Anybody know? Yeah. He'd answer a question with a question. How do politicians weasel out of every question you ask them? They redirect and they answer your question with another question, right? There's a reason that tactic works. Jesus wasn't doing it for political reasons, but he wanted to maintain control of the conversation and not fall into a trap. So if Jesus did that later in life, don't you think that it would be logical to think that he probably did that earlier? I mean, no doubt he grew in wisdom and understanding as the years went on. He was fully God and fully human. We don't understand that. We just know it's true because the Bible says it. That's one of those that we take on faith. But notice here, verse 46, then after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard it were amazed at his understanding and his answers. No doubt Mary and Joseph were good parents. I have no doubt of that. But Mary and Joseph would not have been educated enough to teach their child things that would impress the scribes and the Pharisees that, and those that lived at the temple and studied the law day and night as their profession. See, Jesus, even as a child, was using questions to lead people to answers. See, the Socratic method, you guys should know by now, that's one of my favorite methods of teaching. I like asking questions that lead you to a conclusion for two reasons, primarily. One, because nobody wants to listen to the pastor, because all of us think we know the answers, myself included. So if I tell you something, you're going to reject it, most people, 90% of the time. But if I ask you a question that leads you to your own conclusion, the light bulb goes on and you won't lose it. See, it's a, it's a reality of human nature that if we come to the conclusion ourselves, we don't lose the lesson. But if somebody just hands us the facts, we usually reject it. If you don't believe me, think about parenting and your own journey, both as a parent and as a child, if you are old enough to have experienced both, right? What's the American expression we have to learn the hard way. See, parents can tell children till they're blue in the face, but it's not until the child's ready to receive it that it's going to matter. Well, I shouldn't say that. It does matter, but it's not until the child's ready to receive it that's going to be effective. So Jesus is using that method. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. See, even as a 12-year-old child, Jesus was using his spheres of influence. He's at the temple. Who probably needs to be corrected on understanding the Bible more than those that we later hear him calling a brood of vipers who are whitewashed tombs deliberately taking the scriptures and twisting them to their own benefit? See, this time I'm just leading you right to the answer. Yeah. But if you just rationalize, well, that's Jesus. I'm not Jesus. Of course he could do that. He's God. Well, one, yes, but he's also fully human. But two, have you ever listened to children when they're playing and talking? If you don't think they're trying to influence each other, you had earplugs in. Because every conversation with children is them trying to sway their will one way or another upon the other children. Even the passive ones try in their own way. And then they grow up and still do the same thing. See, that's 
human nature. So, no, you're not Jesus, but you have the same hardwiring and the same capabilities, and believe it or not, the same drive, even if it's not always from the purest place to influence the people around you. And whether you choose to or not, you do influence the people around you. You've all probably heard the saying, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. It's true. Whether you mean to or not, you do influence the people around you. That's your sphere of influence. We also, I'm just going to reference this one, Matthew chapter 9. You have Jesus calling a tax collector. He met a tax collector in his own town and develops a relationship with him. That's his sphere of influence. And then you can turn to Acts chapter 17 if you want. I'm more going to reference it, but that way you can see because we're going to be back in Acts chapter 17 as well. But we see in chapter 17 and verse 17 of chapter 17, Paul is the one that we're talking about here in Acts right now. And it says, so he, this time referring to the Apostle Paul, so he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles. So where was Paul? In the synagogue. Now remember, the church as we know it hasn't formed yet as we're reading here in this chapter. Because Christians are the natural result of Judaism lived out recognizing Christ as the Messiah. So the difference between Jews and Christians at that time was simply, is Jesus the Messiah or not? So they still met in the same building. They didn't have a reason to separate at that time. Because for a while, the difference was minimal. So Paul met in the synagogue. So again, you could paraphrase that. A Sunday school class, a discipleship group, discussion time at church. Paul met and spoke. The difference there is in the synagogues, as I shared with you before, it was normal that it would operate more like a group Bible study. The idea of one person getting up and lecturing the entire time was not the normal way of worship in the synagogue. One person would be the leader, they would get up, they would share the main thought, they would sit down, and then people would share based on that passage, and the leader would guide the conversation. But it wasn't a lecture format. So it was normal that if somebody wanted to share something, that there would be that opportunity. So how did the Apostle Paul reach people within his sphere of influence? He's going to church on Saturday anyway, because it was originally Saturday. He's going to church on Saturday anyway. May as well share with the people there. So you see Jesus as a child in the temple. You see Matthew around town. And you see Paul taking advantage of the natural opportunities to have a discussion. So think about your own life. In your sphere of influence... Where are the natural opportunities? Where are those opportunities that are just people that you're around regularly? And it's normal to have a conversation about any number of things. We can try and bring the gospel into that conversation. If you don't understand how, you can look at these examples. And we're going to talk about that more next week. Again, next week will be more of the how. I'm going to try to answer some of the questions more next week. But I want you to think about your sphere of influence and the conversations and the opportunities that you have to turn and guide those conversations to something of eternal value. We come to church, we profess to love the Lord. We say that we believe that those who believe in Jesus go to heaven and those that don't don't get to go to heaven. It's because of their sin. 
Because if we hadn't been saved, we would be in hell as well. But these are the truths of the scriptures. It should burden us that there are people that we interact with on a daily basis that don't know Jesus and are not going to be able to go to heaven because they haven't been forgiven of their sins. Think about, and I'm not getting into the politics of it. Everybody's in a different place during the pandemic. But think about the middle of the pandemic, kind of at the height of it. How concerned were, was the average person about the health of the person next to them? Pretty concerned considering we shut down society, right? And again, I'm not getting on either side of that political thing. I'm emphasizing how much we cared. And yet, for most people, it wasn't that you were concerned about the other person. It was that you were concerned about whether or not you would be affected. But even if it was from selfish motives, we cared about the health of the person next to us. Do we have that same concern for someone that's going to die and go to hell for all of eternity? That we sit next to every single day and we talk about Clemson or Gamecocks or complain about the weather or whatever our menial conversations are. We, we swallow the gnat and we miss the camel. Just as guilty as anyone. But I want to challenge you. We should have a burden. It should bother us that people around us are lost and dying. I don't think anybody in this building or listening outside or listening online, I don't think anybody listening to this message would drive by a house that was burning and see people in the window and do nothing. You may not be the person to run in, and in general, you shouldn't. But you would at least call 911. Maybe grab a fire hose. If the fire's too big, it's not going to do much. But I don't picture somebody just going, oh, yeah, there's a house burning. Oh, yeah, there's people waving in the window dying right now. Oh, what's for dinner tonight? I don't picture anybody under the sound of my voice doing that. But we've allowed the distractions of life to blind us to the spiritual reality of houses and people burning. And that's where they're headed if they're not forgiven. In your spheres of influence, do you have a burden? And are you willing to have those conversations? Even if it is purely from selfish motives, even if the motive isn't for the glory of God or for the soul of the other person, as we're talking about revitalization and wanting our church to last another hundred years, it's never going to happen unless we reach people that don't know Jesus. So if we have no other motive than that, we should be motivated to reach others with the gospel. But that's our sphere of influence. What about an area that's not our direct sphere of influence? See, as Southern Baptists in particular, it's great that we pool our money with the convention. We are able to accomplish a lot as a group of churches that pool their money and fully support missionaries and schools and things like that. It's great. But one of the downsides is that over time we start feeling like, well, I gave at the office, is the old saying, right? I donated money, I tithed to the church, maybe I donated to a special offering, and that's the extent of my involvement in an area that's not my sphere of influence. It's not enough. Now, I will say if you're faithful in your sphere of influence, 
You may not have a lot of extra time, and that's okay. But simply giving and not being involved in at least prayer and dialoguing with missionaries at the minimum, simply giving is not enough. That's one of the downsides to the model of Southern Baptists putting their resources together is that we've sort of divorced missions from the everyday life of the church. See, a new field is somewhere that you haven't been, somewhere that you personally don't have access to, or you don't have access to it yet. See, maybe you're in a season of life where you have the capability of finding a new field. Maybe you take a job that moves you. Well, now you're in a new field whether you like it or not. Maybe there's a pandemic and everything goes virtual. Now you're in a new field, whether you like it or not. Maybe the pandemic's mostly over and society's opening back up again. And now there's the opportunity for activities, but there's still the need for the presence online adults. Hear me carefully. If you're over the age of 40, hear me carefully. The youngest generation socializes online. So if you want to reach that generation... You have to have an online presence and you have to do it well. It's a new field. There aren't many doing it well. But there's all kinds of ways that you can be in a new field. Your season of life changes, your field usually also changes. Maybe one parcel falls off and another opportunity rises. You guys have heard me share before, martial arts has always been a way for me with new fields. Because as the Lord has moved me around over the years with different ministry positions and school, every time I'm in a new area, I have to find, I have one instructor that I work with, but every time I'm in a new area, I have to find another group to work with. Because the group that I used to be with isn't there anymore. Hasn't happened here because of the pandemic, but that's an example. But what are the areas where you have the opportunity for new fields? Maybe you're in a season of life where there is no such thing as the opportunity for a new field. That's okay. Be faithful in the field that you're in, your sphere of influence. But again, let's look at examples. In Luke chapter 10... Verses 1 through 9, so you can put your finger in Acts 17. We'll come back to that, but go to Luke chapter 10. I'm pretty sure the reference is right this time. Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 9. So this is where Jesus is sending out 70 disciples. This is what you would call one of the first examples of missionaries going out. But this was while Jesus was still alive. See, a lot of people don't realize that Jesus sent out missionaries before his death, burial, and resurrection. This is an example. He sends out 70. So we'll read verses 1 through 9. Now after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. So in other words, he sent people out ahead of himself to prepare the way. In other words, these were new fields, places that People had not been reached previously with the message of Christ. And he was saying to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. See, if you've been in church, you probably know that verse. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Still true to this day. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. See, a lot of times we read that and we think about trying to get things done at church and it's hard to find volunteers. Well, that's true because it's the old adage that, you know, 90% of the people do 10% of the work and 10% of the people do 90% of the work or some other such statistic. Well, that's also true, but that's not what it's talking about here. Here it's talking about people willing to go into a new field. Laborers are few. Therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go, behold, I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. 
carry, this is to the 70, carry no money belt, no bag, no shoes, and greet no one on the way. I wish I had time to unpack that. But in other words, they were going to have to trust God for their provision. And when it says greet no one on the way, he's essentially saying don't get distracted. Keep your focus. Focus on what? We're going to get to that in a second. Whatever house you enter... First say, peace be to this house. Now, super fast, you need to understand in their culture, if, if you went into a town in their culture, and I understand to some degree it's still this way, not entirely, <clears throat> but if you went into their town, you would not find a hotel. It was not common for there to be a hotel because their culture expected that somebody, a stranger somebody you don't know, their culture expected that someone would take them in for the night. That was a core part of their culture. That's actually the definition of hospitality. So when Jesus says, when you enter the house, say peace to this house, peace be to this house, he's talking about a stranger that invited them in for the night. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not keep moving from house to house. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal those who are in it who are sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. And then after that, the ones that don't receive them they're to brush the dust off of their feet. It's a judgment against them. There's a lot to unpack. I could easily do a sermon or even a series in this section. But real quick, I want to point out in verse 7, Stay in that house, eating and drinking, whatever they give you, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not keep moving from house to house. See, a lot of us have been taught that evangelism, missions, is all about grabbing one of those chick tracks. You know what I'm talking about? There's nothing wrong with using a track. Don't get me wrong. But a lot of us have been taught that your goal in missions and evangelism is to grab one of those and give them out to as many people as possible. That's not bad, but it's not best. Jesus told the 70 not to greet people in the way. In other words, don't get distracted from your main mission. Then he tells them, when someone invites you into your house, don't go from house to house. Stay there. Why? Because evangelism and missions are about developing relationships with people to lead that person to a saving relationship with Jesus. And most of the time, that's not going to happen in a casual, quick conversation. Seeds are planted in casual, quick conversations. But transformation rarely does. So you must invest in one or two people. That's why the Southern Baptist Convention went through that thing a few years ago. Who is your one? Right? If uh, You've heard me say this before. You heard Dr. Heddle say it. If every person in this church led one person to Jesus in the course of one year, would our church grow? Theoretically, we would double our attendance. See, that's why I tell you, getting attendance is not the goal. When I sort of seriously told you guys to stop inviting people to church, I mean it. I don't, but I do. Invite them to Jesus. And when they get Jesus, then they're going to want to come to church. But we get it backwards. We think that by inviting them to church... They're going to hear the gospel and God's going to zap them with a holy spiritual lightning bolt and all of a sudden their life is going to change and they're going to accept Jesus because they came to church one time. It happens. But that's not the majority of what see, we see modeled in Scripture. And how many people have we had, even in the midst of the pandemic, visit that aren't here? 
See, it's the relationship that we build in that new field or our own sphere of influence. So even the new field informs our own sphere of influence. It's about focusing our energy on doing fewer things well rather than many things not so well. We also see the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Jesus had an appointment with her. That wasn't his sphere of influence. He went there to meet her. That was a spontaneous conversation. So it does happen. It is modeled, but it's rare. And then I told you to keep your finger in Acts chapter 17. So if you want to go back to Acts chapter 17... Then verse 22, just a few verses after where we were a minute ago, Paul started in the synagogues. That's his sphere of influence. And then where did he go after that? Verse 22, Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus. And you've heard me reference this before if you've been here for the last year or two. He stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, so is he talking to the Jews here? No, he's talking to the Gentiles, the Romans, the Greeks, etc. Men of Athens, I observe you are very religious in all respects. So he's complimenting them. But he's really, it's not just about complimenting. It's about hooking into their identity as a culture. It's about finding a way to use the culture as the entry point that you didn't have before. And I'm going to paraphrase this section. I encourage you to read it. But Paul goes in, and you've heard me, again, if you've been here for the last year or two, you've heard me give some explanation of this. In their culture, they had an open amphitheater that philosophers and people that think themselves philosophers would go to and share their thoughts. Anybody could share their thoughts. And then when they were finished sharing their thoughts, the people that were there would critique them. They would give their thoughts back to them. Now, the goal from a Roman perspective was to sharpen the mind. But it also became a place to introduce new ideas. Younger generation, if you're especially 30 and younger... What does that sound like? Starts with a T, ends with an R. It's Twitter. It's Snapchat. It's whatever social media you're on. Because that's the place that people go to share ideas. And I know you're thinking, well, yeah, that's a cesspool. Yes, it is. But do you think it was any different the Areopagus, where anybody could speak? It was no different. Paul used that, though. He used that as an opportunity to present the gospel. Using what they believe about themselves in their own culture. So he's like, look, you guys are very religious. You have temples everywhere. I noticed you have a temple to the unknown God over there. Let me tell you who that guy is. He's actually the God of gods, the Lord of lords. And his name is Jesus. He used the natural opportunities that existed in this new field. Paul, by all accounts, hadn't spoken there before. Even if he had, it wouldn't have necessarily been the same group of people. Because it was an open platform where anybody could share their thoughts and then people would respond. See, as much as society changes, as much as technology, and younger people hear me carefully on this, as much as society and technology changes, human beings don't. The way that we live things out changes because of the difference in culture, society, technology. But you still have people who are searching for answers. You still have people who think they have all the answers. And then you still have the truth that is the truth whether people like it or not. As Christians, we're convinced 
that the Bible is true. But technology changes. But it's the same thing. Solomon said it best. There's nothing new under the sun. Hey, I grew up in an era where the internet theoretically existed, but nobody knew about it. By the time I was in high school, people knew about it. They were using it, but it wasn't super common. I still used a paper calendar in college. That wasn't that long ago. But you know what hasn't changed? School is still hard and expensive. Life is still hard and expensive. Some people are really good people. Some people stab you in the back. Some people believe in Jesus. Some people have had their sins forgiven. Some people don't and haven't. Technology changes. People don't. Because human nature is human nature. The only change for human beings is when the Holy Spirit indwells someone and changes them from the inside out. That is the only change for people. Everything else is whacking away at symptoms and not solving problems. So again, I hate to kind of leave you on a cliffhanger, but next week we'll give some more practical stuff. I'm going to give you more of the how and the nuts and the bolts, but in one sermon I'm not going to be able to give you everything. But through the next few weeks, I want to introduce you to some tools. I want to introduce you to some concepts that will help you, but will also help us as a church to be faithful in reaching the world for the gospel. It's one thing to say it. Kind of like everybody that wants to go into business. Well, you know, I'm good at doing X, Y, or Z. I should just go into business for myself. Oh, really? Okay. How are you going to handle this? How are you going to handle that? How are you going to handle that? Well, I don't know. I'll make it work, right? Or the old star-crossed lovers of the teenage years. I love him, Daddy. Oh, really? Have you ever met him? No. Does he know you exist? No. But I love him. I'm going to marry him. Good luck with that. See, it's one thing to have theory. It's another to have a plan and be able to execute it in reality. I want our church to be faithful. And the only way that happens is if each one of us as individuals decide, I'm going to be faithful to the gospel. I'm going to get out of my comfort zone and figure out how to reach people in my sphere of influence. Or if there's a new field that I can participate in, I'm going to be deliberate. I'm not asking you to do it all on your own. I'm asking you to take a step. Anybody ever remember that movie, What About Bob? Baby Steps, right? One step at a time. That's the goal. By the way, that's also what the Bible calls faithfulness. There's no such thing as us being perfect on this earth. But God credits us as if we're perfect if we're moving in the right direction. All right, let's pray. Father, I just thank you for the day. I pray that you'd be with us. And Lord, as we've covered some, some hard truths and yet some very simple truths, I pray that you would encourage our hearts and our minds. Lord, I pray that each person here right now would feel the movement of your spirit. I pray, Lord, that you would motivate our hearts and our minds. I pray that you would take off the spiritual blinders that we have allowed to build up, being distracted, just like the kids in the video with the tablets, Lord, just missing the whole point. Lord, help us to take down the distractions and to see the world through your eyes and to have the love and the compassion for those around us to want to see change in their lives as well as ours. God, help us to see from your perspective and help us to be faithful in following you and therefore what you've told us to do. Father, we thank you. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen.